Hey Sherry, there's a, a movement called the New Apostolic Reformation, I believe. Jen Markell has a, has a ministry called Olive Tree Ministries. A couple of weeks ago she did a podcast. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, it was really eye-opening. So you can get online and look up Olive Tree Ministries and you can learn a little bit about the New Apostolic. They've got apostles and prophets and all kinds of things. Quite, quite different. Get our projector going here and we'll continue in the book of Ruth, chapter 2. Things are going to get a little interesting today. We're going to introduce a new character into the story and all. So uh, <coughs> this is going to be Ruth's persistence here. So they got there. I mean, this has to be 
almost immediately after they, they got back to the, the, they were in the start of the barley harvest. I don't know how long it takes to harvest the barley. You know, probably I would imagine within a week, or two at the out at the most. So Ruth, she's on it. Man, she's she, she figures this system out right away, and she's and she realizes that they're hungry and they need food, and so. She, she asked Naomi permission to go glean among the ears of grain. And uh, Naomi says, go, my daughter. Now, there's something wrong here. Or at least I think there's something wrong. What's wrong with this picture? Why isn't Naomi going? This is what it should say. <coughs> Let us go. <laughs> Let us go. So, Naomi's content to, to stay at home and let Ruth go out and, and work among the grain. But, but in my mind, Naomi should have said, let us go. Very good, very good. What do you suppose that was, what do you, what do you suppose she let Ruth go and she didn't go? I think she's still depressed. What if yeah. it was that since it's after one in whose sight I might find favor that she doesn't want to crowd her so she can look for people? <laughs> well, then, this find favor is, is just uh, pure and simple find favor so that you I can right yeah, yeah. at this point. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's not like she's after her position or yeah. attachment or. I don't think that's in the at this point. I don't yeah. think any of this stuff's in the picture. Yeah. I mean, they're just she's hungry. They're hungry. They, I mean, they, they need food. Yeah. They're yeah. poor. They're destitute. It, it had just occurred to me, and I may, be, you know, there'll be a question we have to ask God one day. Um, <clears throat> but Naomi came probably had. Uh, had good circumstances when she and her husband went to Moab. So she may have been embarrassed to go out there and glean because her neighbors would all would see her out there in, in a state of poverty and welfare. And it, why not just let somebody that they don't know go out there and bring her food rather yeah, they, than her? Yeah, that's a good point. Another question I have is where are they staying? <laughs> you know, uh, apparently they must have had a family home, and, and but ten years, you know, you have a small village like that. Ten years later, so somebody probably be in that place. <laughs> so you come back, and we got did they have to evict them or whatever? So this is kind of interesting, interesting things to think about. <clears throat> so let's look at this institution. You know, first of all, we need to see that God is really concerned, has always been concerned about the poor in Israel. So, so who's got Exodus 22, 22 through 24? I do. Okay. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan. If you afflict, afflict him at all, and if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry. And my anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wife shall become widows, and your children fatherless. In order to mess with the widows, <laughs> God said, don't, don't mess with those widows. It won't go well for you. Okay, how about Leviticus 19.15? Always judge your neighbors fairly, neither favoring the poor nor showing deference to the rich. Okay. So basically, don't show favoritism to the rich or, and the, or the poor either one. Basically, the poor. How about Deuteronomy 10? For the Lord your God is God of gods, and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourself were aliens in, G in Egypt. Okay, so, the poor and the, the widows and the aliens, God has, God has a heart for those people. You know, I don't want to get too deep into this, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I 
there's a lot of people who will use these scriptures to say that we should let everybody in the world into our country. You know. But I'm going to tell you what I think, the, what I, just real quickly, what I think the big difference is here. There was no organized government, national government in Israel at this time. Okay. So, when God's given these commands, who's he given them to? People. Individuals. So, when, when I, I think when these people say, we need, to, we need to do this, we need to let all these people in, okay, my question is, how many are you going to take? Because this is what God's talking about. How, how are you going to minister to them personally? This is a personal thing. So that's the difference. And I, and I don't want to go much further than that. But, but, God did not give his give these commands to, to nations, he gave them to governments, he gave them to people. This is supposed to be uh, us showing God's love and God's heart. Okay. How about Leviticus? And God provided a system to provide for the poor, which we sure was talking about earlier. Uh, Leviticus 19, who has that? When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field, or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over with your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so the thought here is that as, you, as you're reaping and harvesting and things that drop on the ground, just leave them. Okay, leave them for, for the poor people who will come behind you and pick up off the ground. And this is what Ruth, the Ruth is asking to do. She just wants to go out to the fields. She wants to go out and say, let me have the, the scraps, what's left over. And also, it's interesting, she said, don't go over it a second time. Harvest it once, anything else pops up. That, that's, God says, that's my provision for the poor. How about Leviticus 23 and 22? Okay, it's real similar. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So God has a very definite heart and plan that he provided. How about Deuteronomy 24? When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheep in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of the Lord. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, when you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterwards. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. Okay. I think it's interesting, and I, the one reason we did, uh, they're all very similar, but God repeats this. Yes. You know, when God repeats things in Scripture, it's, it, we need to take note of it. But He didn't just say this in one place. He said it in at least three there, and there's probably others where God talks about this. So God's serious about this. So, so God says, you know, and we're going to talk a little bit next week about some other things, but, you know, God has promised to provide for them and give them abundance if they'll if they'll obey Him, you know, and all. And He wants them, He wants the people of Israel to take care of the widowless and the and the aging. You know, so God has a, a real heart for this. So God provided this system. Lee, it also it also shows that they must work for their food. Yes. Good point. You know, I mean they're. They're not coming and knocking on their door and handing them stuff free, you know. They have to do something to get it. Good point. Excellent point. I also noticed that, you know, one of the said, what, what did I say was one of the main themes that we were going to be looking at in this book? From, from that. It's the land. Everything in this book revolves around the land. You know, Bruce, you know, all this, the harvest is from the land. God says, you know, on the, your land do not reap to the corners of your fields. There's just so much in this, this whole book about the land. So, Ruth took off 
And she happened to come to the field belonging to Boaz, who was a family of Elimelech. She just happened to come to Boaz. And, and then we get to see our ruthless hero here. Now Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. So, what do we learn about Boaz right on? He's got a heart for the for the people that work for him. For God. Really? Absolutely. And he knows God. And he knows God. He, he knows God. He's a godly man, right? Okay. <coughs> He knows the principle behind even the grave and all that. Okay. Anything else we, you see here? What does the employees think of him? Well of him. Yes. Yeah. They liked him. They were glad to see him. You know, I get you know, I get the feeling that every, that they were glad to see him show up every day. So. so he's an amazing character. We'll talk a little bit more about his. Okay, now as soon as Boaz gets there, you know, he, he, he's, he spots Ruth. And he doesn't know who she is. And so he asks, whose young woman is this? Now what does this tell you about Boaz? He knows who's in the fields. Pardon? He knows who works his fields. Yes, he's aware. He's he's scanning things. He's thinking. He's he knows. Like the Bible says, know the condition of your flocks. You know, he, he knows right away. He knows there's something different. Also, maybe he doesn't want to be with us anymore. He doesn't want to be with us anymore. You know, he does, but he doesn't realize it at this point. <laughs> So the servant says, she's the Moabite woman, okay, who returned with, with, with Naomi, and he kept, gives her a report. She said, Ruth said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So thus she came and has remained from the morning until now, and she has been sitting in the house for a while. <coughs> so what do we learn about Ruth right, right here? She's a hard worker. She's a hard worker. So she, she got to it, started working hard. So we see that you know Ruth asked permission. He didn't just go out and, and assume. Really? I have a note in my Bible, probably from some sermon, that um, Barnabas <coughs> had to ask, but Hebrews did not have to ask. So they make sure they. Maybe so. Okay. Say that again. I didn't hear that. I have a note from a sermon, probably, that foreigners had to ask to glean, but Hebrews did not have to uh, ask. Makes so sense. That's the reason. Okay. We see that. Yeah, it should have been a right. Yeah. So I don't know if it's true, but she was, she was definitely an ass. She didn't just assume it was great. Now, this is where you get, you, you, once you start reading, you're going to love, you got to love Boaz. you got to love this guy. So Boaz <laughs> heads straight to Ruth like a beeline, and he says, listen carefully, my daughter. He's welcome to her. <clears throat> yes. Well, when he realized whose who's daughter <coughs> she was at the house of uh, Ruth, yeah. mm -hmm. that uh, she truly was related to him. Well, she's really not related to him. I mean, by marriage, maybe. Oh, yeah. she's, she's a foreigner. But uh, we see, okay, well, how about just say? Maybe association. Yes. <laughs> and then he says, don't glean in any other fields. He said, stay here with my maids. And he says, let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. And when you're thirsty, go and to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. <coughs> 
So what do you think is going on with Boaz? Well, he's protecting her. Yes, just kind of really putting his armor of protection around him. You know, this is, we're going to talk about this next week. But this is kind of your assignment for the next week to think about. I think Boaz may have been one of the only people in the area, if not the whole tribe of, of Judah, that would have treated Ruth this way. Right. And there's a very specific reason, and we're going to talk about that next week. So, so think about that. There, I think there's a reason why Boaz has this affinity for Ruth. It's look at the, just the kindness that he shows her. A foreign woman... You know, God had told the Israelites that Moabites were despised. <clears throat> that they, they were excluded from the assembly for ten generations. So, so normally the Israelites should have been like, like this toward the Moabites. But uh, Boaz is not, and there's a very specific reason. We'll talk about that next week. So, God provides an introduction. It just so happened that Ruth found the field of Boaz. And Boaz is a relative. He's rich. He's righteous. He's responsible. We see that with his uh, employee. You know, he's respectful for Ruth. He's responsive. And he's remembered. Who has 1 Kings 7 21? I do. <coughs> then he set up the pillars by the vestibule of the temple. And he set up the pillar on the right and called his name the sin. And he set up the pillar on the left and called his name <coughs> Boaz. And this is when Solomon's building the temple. And there's these two huge pillars right in front of the temple. And one's named Jacob or Jacin or whatever. And the other's Boaz, which means an image strength and all. So, so Boaz was a, was a big name in Israel. What about Matthew 1, 5? Simon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse. Okay, so what, what, is, what is this passage? Anybody know what this passage is? Lineage, lineage of Christ. It's a lineage of Christ. He's one of the ancestors of Christ. Boaz is included as, as an ancestor of Christ. As was Ruth. Yeah, She's that, referenced there. Right. <laughs> we'll get into that toward the end, too. That, that, that's a very interesting story. Please, <laughs> what his response is, she just fell on her face, on the ground. Lee, just to, you know, you made a comment that's, I think we just, we need to remember that uh, it wasn't just happen chance that uh, Ruth ends up in Boaz's field. You know, you just, as they say, coincidence is when God chooses to remain anonymous. That's right. You know, and you just see God's hand in all of this right Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's the beauty of this story. You can just see God orchestrating this whole thing and how God's worked in the hearts, you know. So she bows down and says, And why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice since I am a foreigner? And Ruth is acutely aware of her status, that she's a foreigner and that she doesn't truly belong here, or shouldn't, or shouldn't belong here. She knows that she is not of Israel, <coughs> and she, she is acutely aware of that. And then Boaz, this is what I love. Boaz said, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been reported fully to me. And how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to people that you did not previously know. So what does this tell you about Boaz? He's researched her. <laughs> I think she was a talking to yeah. yeah. Obviously, you know, this was a small business sure. You know, but, but Boaz, he's, he's, he's aware. He's, he's aware. He's, he knows what's going on. You know, and, and he's He's checked this out, and he's uh, he seems to be quite impressed with, with the way that Ruth 
who's taking care of Naomi. Maybe Naomi was his favorite aunt or something like that, or one of his favorite relatives, and, and, and because Ruth has taken this good care of her, maybe that. And we kind of know this, that Boaz only find it later. He's a leader, and when it says fully reported to me, it's like people were accountable to him to mm -hmm. let him know what was mm -hmm. going on in town. I like that. Yeah. So maybe, maybe it's. I hate to step back, but it occurred to me that when, not, um, not, when Ruth went to go to the fields and she said, let me go, that there was, she was a partner, but Naomi wasn't. So they probably couldn't have been working the same. She would have had special permission and she would not, right? So that might be another reason why they didn't go along together. I don't know. I think it would have made it easier for Ruth if Naomi had gone with her. But she would still have to ask permission, though, right? Yeah. Naomi said, she's with me. <laughs> but Naomi would have known where Boaz was and known Boaz. This is so that God would divinely set it up and it wouldn't yeah. be Naomi doing it. You know? But was it also dangerous? I mean, it must have been somewhat dangerous to be doing that because he protected her from, he said, don't go to other ones. Okay. So yes. There, there's a hint of that in this. Yeah. And then Naomi, Naomi <coughs> makes mention of, of, right. of that. You so know, Naomi like, might be in danger if she went out there too. So. You're out there in the fields alone and things can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not every boy in Israel was right. totally right. righteous. And, <laughs> well, you know, he's instructing, he, he instructed his men to protect her. Yes. He's not the light hand. Leave them alone and, and don't harass them. And of course, you know, we're in the time of the judges when, when the Israelites were, they were not in, really in compliance mm -hmm. with, with what God's laws were. They may not, they may not have been wanting to fully follow this, this gleaning thing. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take it off. And you're not, you're, I'm not leaving anything for anybody. So. Women were dogs, weren't they? Yeah, Gentiles were. And, I, and then Boaz continues to speak kindly to Ruth. He says, may the Lord reward your work and your wages. I thought that was interesting. Your wages be full from the Lord. I'm a, I think it's just interesting the way that he prays that. <clears throat> when the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Then Ruth said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord. For you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly your maidservant, though I am once again, I am not like one of your maidservants. Once again, Ruth knows her position. And I think this is an interesting phrase, spoken kindly to me. What do you think that might mean? <coughs> Protectively, and also that he didn't refuse her because she was a foreigner. Right. How do you think this... Go on. Finish your thought. How do you think this may have mean that the other townspeople were treated here? Not kindly, yeah. Possibly, I don't know. What were you going to I, I just backing up a little bit. I just, maybe you said this and I didn't pick up on it. But in verse 12, I, I just really am impressed with Boaz where he says, uh, May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. He gives God the credit. Yeah for this. It's not, hey, I'm here to protect you and so forth, but he sees this as his duty and his relationship with the Lord. So how does Boaz see himself? He's just a servant. A of servant Lord. of the Lord. Yes, exactly. So Boaz is seeing himself as an instrument of God's protection here. Very good, very good. What a great guy. You gotta love this guy. You gotta love this guy. And then, so, I guess at the lunch break, everybody gets the brown bags out, you know, and uh, Boaz says, come here, that you may eat of the bread and drink a piece of the vinegar. And so, she sat beside the reapers, and he served her. And here's the boss guy serving this formal. You know, the workers got to be looking at this going, what is that going on? What's happening here? Okay. So... And when she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servants, let her glean, even among the sheep, and do not insult her. Don't harass this woman. And then he says, he goes even further, he says, in fact, pull out a little extra and 
drop it on the ground that she may glean and do not rebuke her. <coughs> wow. Boaz really has an affinity for this woman. You think he's attracted to her? Do <laughs> <laughs> you think that's happening or do you think it's something else? Yeah, he's just ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I see it at this point that this is a, a, a romantic attraction. I think he admires her. Yeah. I think he admires her. Yeah. I think he admires her and <clears throat> appreciative of, of, of her. Okay, so here's what we see with Boaz. Boaz incorporates Ruth into his family. He's called her my daughter. Mm -hmm. He invites Ruth to stay in his field. And he instructs the service to protect you. He encourages you. <clears throat> he blesses her. And he comforts her. You know, Ruth was probably a, a woman really in need of some comfort mm -hmm. at this stage in her life. You know, she's left all her family and everything that she held dear. She's in a strange land, poor. <clears throat> wondering what the future's going to hold. So Boaz, she, she was a woman in need of comfort. Perhaps <laughs> nourishment for her. Go back to her. And he gives her grace. He just sees this grace. You know, so. I think I got this here. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. She took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she also took it out and gave Naomi, Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. So, so she, and this is the rest of Ruth's lunch, so she's sharing this with Naomi. And an epa is a, is a bushel. You know, you know, bushel basket, that's quite a bit. So that would take care of Ruth and Naomi for, for several days. So... So God is really providing in, in Boaz, through Boaz, he's really providing. And so Naomi, if it, you know, it's like every time I get go, get home or every time Carol leaves, the first thing she asks me is, what do I need to know? <laughs> the thing I need to know, you know, what's happened? So, so Naomi starts with the 20 questions. <laughs> so, where'd you leave today? Where'd you work? So may he that knows she be blessed. And so Naomi, uh, Ruth tells her the whole story. And she said, the name of the man whom I work today is Boaz. And now watch what happens with Naomi. So Naomi said, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said to her, this man is our relative and he's one of our closest relatives. So, so look what Naomi's doing here. What is she's included. Yeah. We're starting to see a change in Naomi, aren't we? Naomi's starting to she's feeling encouraged. She's feeling like God is God has not forgotten gotten her. The Lord has not withdrawn his kindness. No, and I and I like that. This man is our relative. You know, you think she might say this man is one of my closest relatives, but she says our brother. So I think that's interesting. And then, then Ruth says, Brother Martin, he told me you should stay close to my service until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi says, it's good that, that you go out with this bay so that others should not fall upon you in another field. Now, we going to talk about this earlier, that, that it, apparently it happened, and, and that's something that they, that they were concerned and worried about, that, that you could get harmed at bleeding. So, Ruth stayed close to the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. Remember we talked about that? Wheat harvest, I think, went into June. So, this is, we're talking about a two to three month stint here. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Okay. So, God provides an inspiration. Now, we begins to have faith in God again. It says, may he be knows that you be blessed. So, we see... That she she started to think better of God right now. I mean, before she was kind of mad at God, and she said <coughs> thought that God was against her. Okay. 
Okay, it says, May he be blessed with the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and the dead. What do you think that means? Why don't you say it that way? Your husband. Yeah, yeah probably showing kindness to her husband and sons. And we see that Ruth is remaining faithful to God's provision. Let's look at Ruth's character. You know, like, how many of y'all think Ruth was a very attractive woman? <laughs> it doesn't say so. <clears throat> don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know if she was physically, I mean physically attractive. We don't know. You know, the Bible does tell us that Esther was a woman of extraordinary beauty. But Ruth is a woman of extraordinary character. And I think that's the thing that we see about Ruth. She, was, she said extraordinary character. And I, and I think that's probably one of the things that Boaz was... You know, if Boaz is attracted at this point, this is what he is attracted to. You know, Ruth took the initiative. She's very respectful. <coughs> she's a diligent worker. She's humble. You know, how she felt to Peter Boaz. And, I realized her position, and she's very grateful. She's very thankful for all that Boaz did for her. She was generous. She was willing to share with Naomi what, what, what she had. She was obedient. Naomi told her to stay there. Boaz told her to stay in his field, and so she did that. She's persistent. You know, she kept at it for you know, two or three months, and she's faithful. She's faithful. <coughs> So now I want to look at one, just one other comment. Um, that verse 12, <coughs> where Boaz says, um, under whose wings, the, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. So Ruth was um, leaning on the God of Israel and that protection that that offers as well. So. You know, and that's one of the things. One of the things I think that attracted, but well, one of them, how many, that attracted Boaz to her, that she was uh, under that protection and headship of the Lord. There's actually a New Testament reference to the under the wings. Anybody know know that one? Yeah. I don't remember. When Jesus it. wept over the, when Jesus wept over the um, Jerusalem. And said, "I long to carry you under my wings." The children my wings. And of course, you know, that's what uh, a mother hen little got her chicks and under her wings. And take them. An interesting picture there. Okay, so let's, who's got these verses? Who? So we're going to talk about Boaz as a type of Christ. You know, this, this whole story of Ruth, remember how I said that I, I think that a lot of these Old Testament stories are pictures, visuals of New Testament principles. Here we have the, this, this idea of redemption, you know, and God, God, Jesus redeeming us, and Ruth, the center of the one who needs redemption, and, and, and Christ is, is our is redeemer. So Boaz, in this story, it's really kind of a picture of Christ. Is that, I don't know they call it a type of Christ. So let's, let's examine that and see, and see if that is in the case. So we said Luke 19.10 For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay. See, Bo, Boaz, as soon as he got to the field, he sought out Ruth, went straight to the tour, and Jesus seeks, seeks us. Okay. How about John 10.14? I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. You know, so Boaz has done his research. He knows about her and, and he knows the condition of his flocks and also so he's like Christ in that way. How about Luke nineteen ten? That's the one I already read. Is there a different verse? Oh yeah, yeah it's it's twice. twice. Yeah, twice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I, yeah, I did have that one in there. I came to seek and save that which is lost. So, mm -hmm. okay. so so Jesus takes the initiative. He comes to us, we don't necessarily come to him. How about John four nine? The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. 
Okay, this is the story of the woman at the well. And a good Jewish boy, back at that time, would not dare speak to a Samaritan woman. It would be verboten. Although they didn't speak German. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but Jesus took the initiative to speak to the woman at the well. And the same thing, you know, Ruth would probably have been mostly an outcast in Bethlehem at this point, but Boaz took the initiative to speak to her and went to her straight to her and was not ashamed in any way to, to talk and show kindness to her. How about John 1.17? Okay. okay. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Okay. Boaz is demonstrating grace to Ruth in the same way that Jesus demonstrates grace to her. How about... Second uh, Thessalonians three three. But the Lord is, but the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Okay, Jesus protects us, keeps us from the evil one. And Boaz is protecting Ruth, keeping her from being fallen upon in some other field. Okay, how about John fourteen one through four? Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, in the way you know. I find those verses are very encouraging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the same way Boaz is encouraging you. How about John 15, 15? I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. So, Jesus includes us, which makes us his friends. We're no longer called a servant. We're Jesus' friends. And, and Boaz has taken root. Basically, my daughter has, has made her part of his family, in essence. Okay, how about Matthew 20, 28? Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Yes. I think this is one of the things about Boaz that kind of, I think, one of the most surprising. That he sat down and served her lunch, you know, as the master, you know, that he was stupid to do that. But, you know, Jesus came to serve us, and Boaz is serving you. And how about Mark 8, 8? So they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Okay. So Jesus fed the, fed the, the crowds until they had more than enough. It's, it's never really happened in that day. That's why they kept chasing after and they wanted more food. Well, you just, you look at all these types of Christ and you, you know, you think to yourself, the old adage that the acre doesn't fall too far from the tree. And I know that Boaz is a great, 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 whatever, granddad of Christ. But you just see this lineage from a man and a woman who would be the, uh, the parent, the great, great grandparents of Christ. And you just see the Christ likeness here that's, that's uh, connected to what we as Christians uh, know about our, our Savior today. Exactly. Boaz and Christ have a lot in common. A lot of great guy, what a great guy. So, what can we learn? What can we learn from this story? Okay. How can we apply this? What, what, you know, how can we follow Ruth's example? So, I think we should ask ourselves some questions. Are you humble? You know, I am. It's, in fact, it's one of my characteristics of which I'm most proud. <laughs> <laughs> but are, are you humble? I mean, do you, do you really do you see yourself as you see yourself, or do you see yourself as as you should see yourself, or as God sees you? Are you? Do you treat others with respect? You know, sometimes we can get a little high person kind of trample on people and be nasty. We all do that at some point. Are we respectful of others? Are you a diligent worker? 
you know, when you're called upon to work, do you, do you go at it or do you have to be goaded all the time? That, 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 I think that's very important in our culture today, just to be a diligent worker. Work is kind of going out of style in our culture. Today. Have a grateful heart. Do you find yourself being thankful for the things that God has given you? Is that, is that part of your prayer life that it's your, it's your thankful? You know, some of us have more than others, but we still have more than the rest of the world. We? <coughs> we need to have thankful, grateful hearts. Are you generous? Are you willing to share the stuff that God has given you? Not just your physical, but also your spiritual. Do you, you share your spiritual insights and your thoughts with others? Do you, do you, do you share that with those around you? Are you faithful? You know, the Proverbs says, Trust in a faithless man in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth or an unsteady foot. You know, as I was a dentist... We did root canals, and so I know about bad teeth. You know, when you have a tooth that's, that's hurting and sensitive, you know, like hot and cold, or a lot of times they're sensitive, hot and cold in the body. You know, you swallow a thousand times a day. Every time you swallow your teeth meet, and if you got a real sore tooth, every time you swallow it, it's a constant ache. It's, you can't get away from it. It's constant. Back in those days, everybody walked everywhere. That was their main mode of transportation. If you had a bad foot, you know, every time you... It was a constant irritation. So Bob, Proverbs says that a faithless person is like that. It's, it's that painful. So we want to be faithful. We want to be faithful to, to what God has given us to do. Be faithful. What can we learn from Boaz? Okay, are others glad to see you? You walk into a room, are, are people glad to see you? They gravitate to you? Are you a joy or are you a joy vampire? Uh, you just suck the joy right out of you. <laughs> you, know, you know those people. You go, oh. <laughs> and I think we if we 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 can all do that, you know. You're, you're like Eeyore in the whole <laughs> ball. People feel blessed after they encounter you. You know, you know, I think you know when Boaz comes on the scene, everybody feels blessed. You know? everybody's, everybody's blessing each other. You know, after you encounter people, do they feel blessed? Do you nourish those around? You? Especially with your words. Proverbs also says, "Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul." And health to the body. Do you nourish others with your words? Do you have an encouraging word? Or do they know they're always going to hear about everything that's wrong from you? And you know, so by the time that you get through this, they're going, <laughs> you know, those people. And I think we, we we can do that very easily. Do you find ways to comfort others? Like a bow you know, and to do this, sometimes you've got to know people. You've got to know what's bothering them. Find ways to comfort them and be aware of others. Are you a source of grace? Do you give grace to people? I fail, I fail in this when I'm driving. <laughs> Carol can tell you that. Or do you find yourself being judgmental? Just some things to think about. I just, uh, I just think of the Galatians five fruits of the spirit. When I see these two characters, you just see that those those fruits uh, in their lives. Exactly. Oh. The joy, the gentleness, the patience, the kindness, the self. The old and the new testament. Yes. They're like this. If you have not read the Old Testament, shame on you. Get in the Old Testament. Start reading the Old Testament. You will understand the New Testament a whole lot better. That it's just all in your Any questions, comments? There's nothing said of Boaz having a family, right? Yes, we don't we don't know that Boaz. There's nothing about children or wife or No, no, we, we don't know anything about them. 
That's a good question. I don't know if he had already had a wife. Don't get that impression. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he had any children. Probably, you know, probably not, because we found out later that Boaz was one of the ancestors of Christ, you know, and his son, Obed, Ruth and Bess, Obed, it, it, is in the lineage, so that you can only be the firstborn, you know, there, so. I, I suspect that maybe he's not. Who knows why? Or his wife died when he was young, or something like that, or whatever. A good question, good thoughts. Great story, just a great, great story. story. Mm -hmm. Great characters, a lot to learn, a lot to think about. So, oh, here we go. We got it. Heavenly Father, we thank for these Boaz and Ruth. What great characters that you've shown us, and so much for us to learn from them. We thank you for their, for the people that they were, and here, what, 3,000 years later, we can still learn from their lives. Father, make us like Boaz and Ruth. Help us to be the kind of people that they were. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah,